Eccentrics, explorers, and amateur anthropologists. This week's podcast focuses on three women who pushed the boundaries of the British Empire literally and figuratively, reinforcing and resisting power. Hello, I'm Lucy, and this week on Footnoting History, we'll be looking at three women in different generations. Hester Stanhope, who used her political leverage to cultivate contacts with the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century, Gertrude Bell, who mapped uncharted territory in the Arabian Peninsula and alarmed Brits and Arabs alike with her manly brains, and Freya Stark, who took a university degree, took up nursing in World War I, took up mountaineering, and took off for Persia because she read about it in the British Museum. The accomplishments of each of these women were often assessed by British audiences in terms of respectability. Insofar as they were granted exemptions from the imperative of being ladylike, it was often because of their social privilege, as in the case of Lady Hester Stanhope, or because of their political usefulness, as in the case of Gertrude Bell. Their travels, research, and writing pushed the boundaries of acceptable conduct, often explicitly resisting social norms. As women, they were scandalous. As British women, they often reinforced imperial control and imperial ideas. Sometimes, as in the case of Freya Stark, this was intentional. Sometimes it was not. With varying degrees of awareness, these women used and enjoyed the privilege of their Britishness. However, and this seems to me a poignant irony, They also used and enjoyed the freedoms that came from being far from the center of empire and free from many norms and expectations of the society into which they were born. Now, before I delve further into the stories of these women, I need to talk about Orientalism. Because although these women explored varying regions and engaged with diverse cultures, there are many commonalities in how they wrote about their experiences and how these writings were received. And the reasons for this often boil down to Orientalism. As defined by Edward Said, who blew academia's collective mind with this theory in the late 70s, Orientalism is, quote, the basic distinction between East and West as the starting point for elaborate theories, epics, novels, social descriptions, and political accounts concerning the Orient, its people, customs, mind, destiny, and so on." Unquote. This may already be sounding eerily familiar to you as Orientalism continues to be alarmingly widespread in the popular media of the Anglophone world. If you haven't heard of Said's theory before, you owe it to yourself to blow your own mind by listening to the opening song of Disney's Aladdin with it in mind. I owe a shout out to Bernardo Michael, the historian who blew my undergraduate mind by having his class do just that. Now, Orientalism helps explain how the East, with implied capital letters and scare quotes, was treated as it was by the British, and how the women in this podcast framed their activities and writings. In North Africa and the Middle East, British control was tenuous, indirect, and shifting, affected both by local politics and imperial rivalries. One of the characteristics of British imperialism was to characterize the cultures they encountered as having stereotypically negative, womanly traits, being more emotional, more fickle, less stiff upper-lipped than the rigorously educated white sons of empire who ruled them. Thus, the women of this podcast inhabited, inevitably, ambiguous positions. Hester Stanhope, born in 1776, traveled in areas without much imperial control, British or otherwise. As the date of 1776 will have suggested to our American listeners, Britain did already have an empire, but much of its infrastructure had yet to be created, although colonial interests were destructive in human terms. Lady Hester, born into the top tier of English society, was aristocratic and iconoclastic. In her late to mid-twenties, she lived with her uncle, none other than William Pitt. Acting as hostess to the Prime Minister was arguably the ultimate political job for a young woman like Lady Hester to take in England at the turn of the 19th century. After her uncle's death, however, she was at a loose end. 
So she traveled to Gibraltar and Malta, as one does. In Malta, in 1810, she met Michael Bruce, a man 10 years her junior, and they began a passionate love affair. Still unmarried, they spent several months in Malta, a year in Constantinople, and then traveled to Cairo, where they were ceremoniously received by Mehmet Ali Pasha, almost certainly due to Lady Hester's strong political connections. She really did know everybody. Throughout this period, Lady Hester maintained a vast correspondence on everything from international diplomacy to household maintenance. She also served, or rather asserted herself, as a consultant to the Pasha of Acre. She traveled in style and, when entering Damascus, chose to wear Turkish male clothing rather than a veil. She continued to wear such dress till the end of her life. Her English biographer took pains to assure readers that, quote, to Western eyes there was nothing particularly masculine about it, attempting to make Lady Hester's conduct seem less transgressive. As she told the story in letters, after a triumphal entry into Damascus, she was treated as, quote, the oracle of the place and the darling of all the troops who seem to think I am a deity because I can ride and because I wear arms, unquote. After a journey to Palmyra, during which she organized troops, Lady Hester wrote that she had been crowned queen of the desert under the triumphal arch of the city. How much of this is true remains open to question, but it seems certain that her efficient and authoritative conduct and her confusingly hybrid status between male and female, between British and non-British, were both impressive. Whereas the honor shown her was interpreted by British audiences as the natural deference shown to British people by lesser mortals, it seems far more likely that the ceremonies and titles were at least in part a recognition of Lady Hester's specific and useful contributions to military and diplomatic operations. Lady Hester spent her later life living in Lebanon, in a former monastery. She tried to persuade the Ottoman government to join a search for buried treasure, but mostly just studied the occult, as one does, I suppose. Both during her life and after it, she made the social establishment she came from anxious, but was also the subject of public interest. Her niece eventually issued a book with editions of her letters so that it might function as, quote, the authorized biography of this strange woman, unquote. Although subsequent commentators have sometimes shaken their heads over poor, mad Lady Hester, she continued her correspondence, her authoritative household management, and her entertainment of visitors, albeit occasionally. She appears far less as a woman pining, or a woman distracted by occult concerns, than a woman doing her utmost, despite ill health, to give long-distance political advice. This was, predictably, not received kindly. Finding her room strewn with bundles of documents, writing cases, and papers, her doctor sniffed, never was a lady's room seen before in such a condition. Hester herself, extolling her own exploits in an attempt to get support for her pension claims from the Duke of Wellington, wrote that he was the best judge of what she had had to do, quote, among a semi-barbarous people, unquote. Less than a paragraph later, however, in discussing her diplomatic engagements with the Pashas, she says, I fought them all round, single-handed, and said that I acted neither in the English or the French name, but in my own, as a poor Arab. This dizzying internal contradiction is typical. Elsewhere, employing a trope as old as Tacitus, she writes, when the world becomes still more corrupt, when civilized people become still more brutal and still more incisive, it is a pleasure to reflect that there is a spot of earth inhabited by what we call barbarians, who have at least some sense of honor and feeling. In identifying herself as an Arab, or writing of English people as monsters, which she also did, Lady Hester was using a freedom of expression given her because of her own privileged station. By the time Lady Hester died in 1839, the shape of the British Empire was changing. Moving forward into the late 19th century, we encounter Gertrude Bell, who came of age at a time when opportunities for women were expanding, but social attitudes were far from catching up. In many ways, Bell was a woman of paradoxes. 
She worked in British intelligence and worked for political autonomy in the Arabian Peninsula. She was fiercely intelligent, fiercely opinionated, and the cause of both pride and exasperation in the British political establishment. As a young woman, she was frustrated by the society in which she was expected to mix. As she wrote in a diary entry, quote, if I only have to say, how do you do 20 times, I don't care whether it's to my friends or my enemies that I say it, unquote. Though women couldn't yet earn university degrees at Oxford, she studied there to her own delight and her family's despair and earned first class honors in modern history. She was promptly sent abroad to her uncle and aunt to mingle in society and get rid of her Oxfordy manner. This plan backfired stupendously. She made numerous diplomatic contacts which would serve her well in the years to come. In 1892, she visited Persia, now Iran, studying the language and the customs. Her parents forbade her engagement to a British embassy official, but she successfully published a collection of travel essays and an acclaimed translation of the medieval poet Hafiz on her return. Perhaps the most impressive thing to me about Gertrude Bell is her indomitable energy, simultaneously learning a language, conducting a romance, and publishing widely. Deeply impressive. After Persia, she spent a decade traveling the world and climbing mountains, as one does. In 1900, she was invited by the German consul to visit Jerusalem. She loved it. She improved her Arabic. She took her first journeys on horseback into the desert. Her interest in archaeology kindled, she undertook further exploratory journeys, focusing on Byzantine churches in the second part of the decade. Her letters and diary entries make clear that she found travel to be liberating from the restrictive expectations of life in Britain. This is particularly ironic in light of her anti-suffrage activities during the time she did spend in England. Abroad, she explored territory unknown to Europeans and created photographic and descriptive records still valuable to archaeologists. She described her explorations of the banks of the Euphrates as an attempt to record the daily life, the speech, of those who had inherited the empty ground where empires had risen and expired. The focus on empires is outdated and telling, but how gorgeous is that prose? The outbreak of World War I transformed Gertrude Bell's planned expeditions. After a stint doing Red Cross work, she returned to the Middle East, using her connections with local authorities and European diplomats alike. In Arabic, English, French, and German, people kept commenting on her manly brains, the most famous of backhanded compliments. Sykes, of the notorious Sykes-Picot agreement, complained, quote, confound the silly, chattering windbag of conceited, gushing, flat-chested, man-woman, globe-trotting, rump-wagging, blethering ass, exclamation point, unquote. Such misogynist attitudes notwithstanding, Bell continued to get her hands on almost every diplomatic deal going on. And during this time of global conflict, with the Ottoman Empire losing local influence, the British and French empires panicking about theirs, and local powers looking to forge autonomous infrastructures, there were a lot of diplomatic deals going on. Bell, although anything but free of racist and orientalist attitudes herself, was highly critical of the patronizing attitude that Western nations had a duty to, quote, guide small oriental states and not allow them liberties which they would certainly abuse, unquote, as she scornfully summarized the views of one French archaeologist. Still, one of the reasons she herself came to support the formation of independent Arab governments in the aftermath of World War I was because she saw it as a cheap way of maintaining a British presence in the region. She served as Oriental Secretary in Iraq, there's that Orientalism again, working directly with local governments. Her existing friendships with, and knowledge of, local authorities made her valuable to the British. In 1921, with the crowning of the British ally Faisal bin Hussein bin Ali al Hashimi as Faisal I of Iraq, Bell wrote, We've had a terrific week, but we've got our king crowned. I'm glad I lived to take part in this thing, and to record it. This perhaps encapsulates Bell's attitudes. She stayed on in Iraq to establish the Museum of Antiquities in Baghdad, a work of which she was very proud, as she saw it as a crucial element of teaching the history of the region. 
As a historian, I'm of course always heartwarmed by the preservation of antiquities. At the same time, it's impossible not to cringe at the imperialist presumption of teaching people about their own history. Bell herself, remarkable as her own knowledge was, was also capable of overestimating it. Dorothy Van S., a woman who moved in Bell's social circles, got along well with Bell and considered her a friend, but was also profoundly bothered by Bell's cavalier generalizations about, for instance, the religious attitudes of Arab peoples. She once confronted Bell about this at a party and told her, you'd speak differently, Gertrude, if you knew anything about it. And to this, the proud and intrepid woman replied simply, touche. Freya Stark was a slightly later contemporary of Gertrude Bell's and a remarkably resilient and resourceful woman. She survived a childhood machinery accident in which she was partially scalped, was educated at home, and as a teenager took a correspondence course before taking up the study of history at the University of London. Her life only became more adventurous from there, as she did nursing work in Italy during the First World War and took up mountaineering after the war. Prone to ill health, she started Arabic lessons during a period of convalescence and moved to Lebanon to pursue these studies in 1927. Stark's first major expedition was made to the Jabal al-Druz in southern Syria. The Druze are an ethno-religious group, often the object of persecution, and Stark wanted to discover their distinctive customs. She and her companion, Venetia Budicom, were by their own account welcomed by the Druze, although they were treated with suspicion and almost arrested by French troops, who were very suspicious of British women traveling in what was a French imperial mandate. Stark's next journey took in Baghdad and the ruined fortresses of the Assassins, a much misunderstood medieval sect. Her subsequent work, The Valleys of the Assassins, improved existing cartographic records and earned her a prize from the still male-dominated Royal Geographical Society. When Stark gave a talk at the Society, Sir Thomas White said, quote, she joins the great trio of English women, with Gertrude Bell and Hester Stanhope, who have brought such luster to the British name in the East, and it is a great name." Unquote. This raises an interesting question of reception versus intent. Whereas Stark's own priorities were scholarly, her activities were politicized by her British audience. Stark did not remain in England long. She planned a trip to Persia after reading about it in the British Museum. Who does that? Freya Stark, apparently. Living in Baghdad, Stark was treated as an outsider by the British community, who regarded her penchant for dressing in Arab clothing and roaming the city with deep suspicion. In 1930, she wrote wistfully to her mother that no one seems to want women very much. The publishing of several books, however, gave her the resources to indulge a taste in flamboyant hats, which I find rather fabulous. She worked for the Ministry of Information during World War II, and was particularly active in attempting to organize support for British policies through holding secret tea parties. Just please savor that for a minute. Foreign policy through tea parties. Peak Britishness may have been achieved right there. Stark's own political engagement highlights what seem to me like puzzling contradictions. While diligently seeking information about the many places she traveled, and deeply empathetic with the people she encountered, including those involved in nationalist movements, she remained actively pro-empire. In later life, she turned away from politics and towards history and landscape. The fact that she was able to travel on rafts and horseback with BBC crews into her 70s, however, was itself shaped by Britain's imperial legacy. This wide-ranging survey of women explorers shows us something of how their available roles changed from the late 18th to the mid 20th century. Lady Hester Stanhope and Gertrude Bell could call on upper-class connections. Freya Stark was of less exalted origins, but still had the privileges of a middle-class education. Each of these women used countries perceived as essentially other from Britain to escape restrictive social expectations, and also used the privilege of their Britishness in doing so. Each of these women took on multiple roles, any one of which would have sufficed to make them remarkable. Lady Hester was a noted socialite in an age when diplomacy and dinner parties went hand in hand. She proceeded to become a multilingual explorer, further demonstrating her considerable political intelligence. 
Gertrude Bell, androgynous archaeologist explorer extraordinaire, defied expectations at every turn. She was a powerful agent of empire, a thorn in the side to many British officials, and a supporter of independent, but British-friendly, government in the Middle East. Perhaps most significantly, she was a tireless and talented linguist, translator, and archaeologist. Freya Stark, geographer-spy, appears to have thrown herself into work that no one else did, in part because society didn't present her with work she felt she was well-suited for. Her linguistic and map-making abilities stood her in good stead in exploring Syria, Persia, and Iraq. Her skills also made her valuable to the British government. In acknowledging her achievements significantly, the Royal Geographic Society linked her with Bell and Stanhope, whose careers were in fact strikingly different from hers. Each of these women, however, is notable for the ways in which they used their privilege to escape the restrictions placed on women by British society. Despite the centuries and distance separating them, there are remarkable similarities in British attitudes towards the imagined East and indeed also towards the rule-breaking women who set out to explore the diverse cultures of North Africa and the Middle East on the ground, whether cross-dressing, hosting clandestine tea parties, or both. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.